and for this, I'd like to introduce Elizabeth uh, Armstoff. Uh, El Elizabeth or Lizzie uh, is a project manager for market research, uh, innovation and technology transfer at DESI in Hamburg. And Lizzie, I hand over to you. Tell us all about this startup school that we've heard about uh, a few times now. Welcome, Lizzie. Okay. Good morning. <laughs> Good morning. Thank you, Marilyn. Um, I'm Livy Hansdorf. I work on the Carrots project and I was part of the team that launched the first ever startup school for scientific service companies. Let me take a moment to tell you the story of the startup school before I hand over to our CEO coaches and two of our students, Solange and Ahmet. Okay. So it all began last year with the need to further extend this emerging market, which you've heard Ron speak about earlier. We wanted to help found new scientific service companies in the European innovation ecosystem. So from March to June, we set up a program um, that helped with knowledge transfer, networking, coaching, and help these new scientific companies to found. We already knew as a team a lot about the business model, the financing solutions available, and we had formed this uh, network of CEOs via the Nixon network that Anna spoke about. So we recruited six CEOs uh, alongside an entrepreneurial e-learning team. And through a European-wide advertising campaign, we attracted 48 applications and of these 48, we awarded 11 places to the best business ideas. And of these 11, they were PhD students, scientific staff, postdocs, a third of them were women. And they came from countries such as Sweden, Estonia, Switzerland, Germany, and Finland. And all of these uh, students were at different stages of their entrepreneurial journey, and we'll hear a bit more from Salanj and Ahmet shortly about their first-hand experiences. So what did we do? In total, we delivered five webinars in entrepreneurial mindset, business model canvas, financial management, marketing, and an additional module in storytelling. Each of our students received two one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions with their CEO. And at the end of the school, the students had to pitch their business idea to a panel. So exciting stuff. To date, we already have one team that has founded, and this is Armit and Scattering, and we have four more in the pipeline. I think with everybody involved, everybody felt it was a very, it was a great learning experience and students got direct access to CEOs and they learned the top tips on what to do and what not to do. So let's take a quick look at these graduates. Um, we're really excited for them and their entrepreneurial journey this year and next year. And we wait in anticipation for the next Carrot Startup School. I'll hand back over to you, Marilyn. Thank you, Thank Lizzie. You. Yeah, excellent. This is, um, well, that sounds very exciting. So it is, uh, uh, we will actually now um, invite two of the coaches that participated in the startup school and two, two entrepreneurs who benefited uh, from the startup school um, adventure. So let me introduce our, uh, our four next speakers. It is my pleasure to welcome, to welcome Andrew Bill, uh, the Chief Scientific Officer at Finden, uh, Solange Sanayuya, the CEO of Crispy AI, Bernard Hess, uh, CEO of Exploration, and Hamed Bahadir Yildiz, the CEO of Scattering. Welcome to the four of you. Um, okay, we are in, in, the next, in, the, in the next 20 minutes or so, we want to understand what happened in this startup school and uh, whether it has been a game changer for you too, Solange and Hamed. But before we get to that, uh, Bernard, can I start with you? You were uh, one of the CEO uh, in, the, in the school. So what, um, well, do, what, wh how was it? Tell us about uh, your experience there and uh, what, wh why was this startup school slightly different from any other startup school that you know of? Yes. <clears throat> yes. So for me, it felt like actually I moved back in time because we received the same questions 
that we had in mind when we started our company about five years ago. And um, so we could discuss with them and share our insights about how to deal with access to synchrotron or large scale facilities with this administration stuff around forming a company, how to find um, also stuff. And um, I think the most critical insight we discussed was how to how to get customers and how to get the, let's say into into new business and how to convince our industries that we are targeting to, to work with us. Because I think that this model of scientific service providers is still, as we already heard today, is not, um, let's say, well known by, by, by our potential clients. And so we have to, we had to do some work in introducing ourselves there and um, yeah, making us visible and to convince them that they have benefit through us. So what's the value proposition and how to formulate this? And I think that was very, I, I saw like if I had this kind of discussions five years ago, we were, were a bit faster uh, by now. So, but it's still nice that other younger companies um, can, I think, benefit from, from, from our insights there. And also for us, it was very interesting to hear these questions and also great ideas by very in, inspiring people, I would say. And um, well, I think the difference to answer your question is, um, I think that we were very specific with, with what we could share and we could discuss, which is a bit different from, from other startup school, I think. And I think to me, the most amazing outcome of it was that we have Ahmed now here together with Peter, who actually started his company Scatterin. And um, this is clearly an, an highlight of this. And actually, I'm quite looking forward to collaborate and work with him in the future. Fantastic. So it's not only a coaching, it's a partnership maybe that, uh, yes. that, has, that was born in the, in the startup school. Andy, can I turn to you? You were also a coach uh, in the startup school. Um, so from your perspective, what were the main aspects of your own experience with Finden that you wanted to share with Solange? Uh, with, I think that you, you trained her, right? You coached her. Yes, yes, yes. We were lucky to have Solange with her great idea uh, and to work with her on trying to develop it. Um, to, to, to answer your question, I think, you know, as Bernard also kind of highlighted, having this or doing this exercise was very, very beneficial, uh, not only for us as a refresher to actually what we went through, but then also to point out where we had problems trying to um, get traction, let's say, as a company. And then also able to pass that on to uh, not just Solange and some of the other people we coach, but I think within the wider Carrots community. Uh, so I think there are lots of key issues or lots of questions, of course, that anybody with a startup company has. You know, questions particularly, I think, relevant to Solange was uh, IP. You know, at what point do you need to put into place, you know, intellectual property protection? Is this a key element to starting up a company? Or is it something that can wait, if you like? And I think that was um, something that, you know, we also had discussions about when we started up. And of course, Carrots allows you to put it totally into context. Um, if it doesn't necessarily help to answer that question uh, from our perspective or from Solange's perspective, if you're a startup company, because I think it's very specific to what you're trying to do. But I think that and then the wider context of, I think Bernard also touched on this, is customers. How do you get customers? How do you start up your company? And you know, revenue streams. These are all things actually when we started up, we didn't really realize, um, well, it's difficult. You have some ideas as to how you think you will generate business, but actually what you often find is, is that there isn't, and in fact, it's important that there isn't you know, one or two mechanisms. In fact, you have to engage quite broadly so you've got to have very diverse income streams. And as I said, I think a key thing for us was realizing that actually we found sometimes uh, bespoke solutions to this income problem. Um, and I think, you know, a key element or key take home message is if you're quite flexible, and I think that's a good thing about small businesses, they can be flexible and quite agile, able to respond quite quickly. You can often find solutions and hopefully, you know, grow the business. That's good. It raises a number of questions. So, uh, and that I have a few questions for you and Bernard, but I'll just uh, hold uh, a little longer before addressing them to you, because we'd like now to hear from Solange and Hamid. So uh, you were both um, 
beneficiaries of the startup program and the startup school program, I should say. And so if you imagine, if you both imagine that in the, in the audience today, you have potential partners and who knows, maybe investors, um, can you present both uh, your company like in some kind of elevator pitch, uh, just explaining what it is about the solutions you offer, what you're looking for and how you see the future of your companies? You have just uh, two, three minutes to do that. And Solange, I will uh, invite you to start. So I know you have a few slides so we can show them on the screen. And I hand over to you, Solange. Go ahead. Convince us. Hi. <laughs> so I will share. It's only one slide. So okay. It's, it's easy. Uh, um, do you see it? Yes, go ahead. Okay, okay. Very fine. Uh, wait, I cannot see it fully. <laughs> so, um, yeah, what's about my company? It's not existing yet, but. Um, our scientific services company is called Crispy AI, and it's in the initial stages of founding. We are mainly based in Switzerland, uh, and one team member is in France. So what is it about? What is the context of our service proposition? We talk about consumers, food consumers. They want healthy food, but it should also taste great. And it can be hard for food companies to provide a satisfying crispy product while meeting an acceptable price, sustainability standards, and reducing food waste. And there is no practical, cheap, and accurate method to measure crispiness during development and production. So we support quality, R&D, and production managers with a measurement method that gives a clear statement for in-out quality checks of food crispiness. How we do that? Um, first, we optimize how food, such as chips, is crushed with machine to collect the, the crushing force, like in the mouth, and the audio data, like in the ears of humans. Then we use artificial intelligence to sort the data into crispiness levels um, that predict um, consumer sensations. And this methodology can be also applied to measure other food, cosmetics, and medical product properties or to understand and sort any complex data. For example, for maintenance, maintenance uh, with predictions of um, machine failure or for diagnosis in patient sicknesses. So the application is very broad. Just now we focus uh, with our first customer on ships, which is a worst case scenario um, because of the high variability of each potato, potato, uh, type and time in the year, during the year and season. So here is really a challenge and we are pretty confident that we can help here. Moreover, I really still enjoy after years of crushing samples. <laughs> um, yeah, the breaking behavior, the zigzags in curves and the noise is really fun. <laughs> so what we are looking now is for partnerships, for customers. And I know that what helps is to tell future customers that we already had customers. It's what they asked for. Did it work? Uh, who you work with? So this is like what I'm looking for first. The call is very clear. Uh, so this is good. What was your, um, how, where did you enjoy the startup school program? But uh, how did it help you? Mm -hmm. I enjoyed it a lot and it gave me uh, like uh, steps to follow and push a bit because during all the daily work, it's hard sometimes to find the time uh, to think deeply about your business idea and to really go into it. So I learned also a lot um, from the others' experiences. There were several coach, uh, coaches and coaches exchanging their ideas and their problems and how they did it. And in particular, I would like to thank the Carrots team and my coaches, Simon and Andy, for their very good advice uh, for our business idea, business model, how to implement. Uh, and also we discussed uh, several ways to grow and fall. And this is like um, an up and down process. So I know I'm confident and I will try error, try error, continue. Another thing which, which I really loved is uh, the storytelling workshop because we could um, produce a short advertisement movie, train how to formulate simply, 
uh, what we want to explain to customers or other people. <laughs> Excellent. Solange, we do wish you the best with crispy AI because that sounds like a very, very good idea and, uh, and proof of concept. Hamet, your um, scattering, your company is actually formed, right? It's been incorporated into a company, so you're slightly more advanced. But tell us all about uh, well, your, your idea, your solutions, your team, and what you're looking for. Hamet, in two minutes, tell us all about scattering. Yes, uh, Solange, could you please uh, close the screen share? So yes, <laughs> yes okay. thank you. Go ahead, Hamid. Yes, is it visible now? Yes. To everyone, great. Uh, we are Scattering, Stockholm-based startup, spun out from research at KTH, Royal Institute of Technology. We have been officially funded. Uh, last July, like you said, like you mentioned. And in scattering, we deal with engineering materials, processes, and components. Scattering helps industry use world's most powerful microscopes and make understanding driven innovations in materials and processes possible. We need to understand and quantify structural changes in materials during and after production in service. However, inefficient analysis methods and data analysis protocols hinder rapid progress and bringing innovations to market. In scattering, we offer streamlined access to the synchrotron X-ray and neutron facilities to develop, test, and validate products in representative process and service conditions. And we do this in four adjustable steps, starting from defining the problem. For example, our industrial partner may want to know at which state of their process they get the unwanted phase so that they can tune the process if we work together on this and show them when or they may need to understand how the structure of their material evolves during service. We then choose the most suitable solution, neutrons, X-rays, or maybe we can solve the problem at lab. We also help with preparations, including sample and sample environment, for example. We perform the measurements, and finally, we do the analysis and interpretation of the data. For specific cases, we can do all four steps within one to three months of period. My name is Ahmed Badr Yildiz. I am the CEO of Scattering, and our co-founder and CSO is Peter Hestrom. And we will be happy to discuss the possibilities and, of course, the challenges if you reach us. Thank you. Thank you, Hamid. Quick question for you first, and then to the whole panel. Uh, Hamid, the, you founded your company after you went through the startup school program. Was, how did it help you, or did it actually help you? Yeah, it did definitely, we would say. So first of all, we haven't met any scientific service company before. It was the first time we met and saw how things can it be if we do it correct? And our coach was Bernhard, and he has mentioned like uh, he wish he, they had this chance before, and we agree. Thanks to coaching and uh, care startup school, we had a good background. We get the initial kick, and we possibly uh, hinder the mistakes that we might have uh, do during the process and in the near future. So I would say, I think we save some months and probably years of experience thanks to the startup school. And yeah, one more thing is like, it was really in detail. It includes anything that we need from finding customer, being customer and need oriented, to also some practicals like cash flow, for example, the things that 
you don't normally don't think that much in the very beginning. So it was very useful for us. Thank you. And so if any of you in the, in the audience um, are entrepreneur, or if you know of any entrepreneurs who might be interested in the startup school, do reach out to the, to the project team. And uh, you're also very welcome to ask questions to uh, these uh, four uh, presenters in the, through the chat uh, to the Q&A if, uh, if you'd like to. But I, I do have a question for you all. Do you think there is a recipe for success? Uh, for scientific service companies, is there, or, or do you think that because of the, the specialty or the level of expertise or the area of expertise of these companies, or even the regions they're located in, make the, the coaching, the, the personal coaching essential? But is there um, some ingredients or some recommendations that you can give here? We'd like to go fast. Solange, go ahead. <laughs> Uh, for me, one, one uh, thing is uh, always ask the user <laughs> first so you can always profit from their real needs and uh, really uh, offer what helped them and evaluate with them if, if they would uh, buy or not at the end. And um, when it's a B2B um, relationship, as in our case, uh, then we can call even sometimes the CEO of tiny companies because they are all only human. So yeah, train and train and then one step of the, after the other, uh, it will be easier. And this also we discussed uh, with Andy, like being natural and showing and asking. It's not so complicated, but first try it. <laughs> it's this hurdle that you need first to, to cross. Yeah, and Take the phone. <laughs> Andy Bernard, would you would you have been able to train any potential or future scientific surface company? Uh, yeah, so uh, my my experience, I think, of this this school is is that actually there I think there are elements that are very underpinning, and I think that was actually covered well by the current school, and I think this gives people a framework. Uh, but there's certainly regional variations, and even for example. Uh, depending on how you want to start up. So certainly, uh, as there are a lot of academic ties with a lot of the, you know, the CEOs or the new CEOs, you know, there are some universities that I think are better at spinning out uh, activities than, than others. And I think this also will depend a bit on the region as to the sort of level of support you can get for such activities. So I think my take home message would be, yes, there are core elements that's particularly covered well by carrots. Um, and I think that there are other aspects, other dimensions, which might mean that there are more opportunities for some, uh, depending on where you are from. Bernard, do you want to come in on that question? Would you, would you have trained any uh, future company? Is there like um, a structure, a program that you can actually apply across the board? Well, I think yes and no. So I think as, as Andrew said, so there's some general things that may apply for all companies, but I think it's good that we were focusing on this scientific service providers that are basically using this large scale research facilities, because I think in the end, it's quite a specific, specific niche and uh, the challenges we have as a scientific service company is also uh, different to, to other startups that uh, have other, let's say, uh, offer offerings. But I think the well, the most important things and the most but I think the most yes, the most important message is you have to you have to try, you have to um, and then you have to try harder and again and so on. And this is something that may apply for for all kind of, of, of startups. Very good. I want to also ask you to the four of you. What do you need to scale up your company or to launch it in the case of Solange? But Finden and Exploration are pretty, already pretty well established, but we, yeah, there are probably some growth uh, prospects. So what do you think a, service, uh, a scientific service company need to scale up beyond the startup school program? Because um, we can also look at, at um, your cases, Finden and Exploration. I mean, in, in, in the back of my head, it's we're talking about services here, not a product. So can an SSC become a unicorn one day? Who wants to go? Uh, Andy, I, I go. can start if you like. 
I think as you highlighted, I mean, as a, as a scientific service provider, we are generally trading on our expertise and therefore we're a bit limited in terms of resource. As you say, we don't have a product that necessarily scales. Um, where we've been able to sort of scale up is that actually, um, well, I think availability of talent is critical here. So in fact, we've almost sort of done it the, the other way around is that we've actually found some high quality talent, employed them, and then they've opened up opportunities. And I think they, what's attractive for them to be part of a company like Finden is that we are an SME, so they get exposure across the board. So they're not just turning a handle, let's say, providing solutions to a scientific problem, but they're also learning about pitching to clients, uh, writing proposals. This is another key thing. Uh, one of the key messages we have in the booklet accompanying these activities is that, you know, registering for uh, national and international funding schemes is critical. And of course, particularly with the European Union, there's a lot of focus on supporting SMEs. So, of course, if you look, I think the EU has a statistic that says something like 99% of employees are working on with SMEs. So effectively, it's, a, you know, what we're doing now is actually more typical of the working life environment than what, say, working for big companies like. So I think, you know, for us, uh, scalability it comes with kind of having the expertise, accessible, accessibility to expertise and funding. But I think in order to scale, and in fact, something we're trying to do now, it, we are trying to, you know, productize some of the stuff we're doing. So that could be software, it could be expertise that's translated in, into a product that we can scale. So I think um, that may not be something that works for everybody. We've, we've certainly seen scientific service companies in the past just scale with the amount of provision that uh, they and expertise they can provide across a particular, um, uh, I suppose, sector of the business. All right. We heard from Solange what she needs to get started. What about you, Bernardo, Hamet? What do you need to um, to scale up exploration of scattering? In a very uh, very short comment, please. Maybe from oh, us. Go ahead. ahead. Uh, please okay. go ahead, Bernard. Okay, so I think from our perspective, it's um, there's some some sometimes on the path there's opportunities, and you have to realize that there are actually opportunities, and then you you have to grab them. And I think this is how we how we scaled. I think so. There was a chance of of new business opportunities, and we took them. We tried to then um, focus on these new opportunities. And also, uh, same as Andre said, so we hired new stuff and they brought in new expertise and so on. I don't think that the scientific service provider will become a unicorn, to be honest. But I think there's room for for growth. And um, in the very beginning, in our first year, we had a discussion with a venture capitalist. And he said, basically, there's no way that we will receive money from them because we're providing service and not a product. And there's no scalability. I think they are mistaken because I think there is some degree of scalability. And there's for sure potential for growth, but um, I think we do it um, our own now on a on a slow but very steady, um, sustainable rate. Hamed, do you want to come in before we conclude? Yes, shortly. So I'm not in a position to give advice, but I can mention what will we do in scattering. So we first started with our let's say so-called uh, early adopters, and now applying for funding. So which means we are funding dependent and it gives more responsibility for scaling up, let's say. So we will be working on our products and offerings and pricing at the same time working on projects. And also we will have the time to develop our backend, our software product. And then we are hoping there will be right time in the near future to scale up for us as well. Thank you, Hamid. I just have one final question for you, Andy. I think you were mandated by the current project to tell us what's going to be the future of the startup school. So what is it going to be? Uh, well, I think we were all impressed with, you know, the first efforts as far as carrots were concerned. So currently now discussions are ongoing about carrots too. Uh, so we're hopeful that something will be running uh, again next year uh, and one thing I should mention is that a few of us a few of the CEOs from this initiative have now are in the process of setting up a company to help uh, startups get going so 
sort of administrative headaches, you know, discussions about IP, for example, you know, we can provide that additional support, which I think will accelerate the growth of these, or the at least getting going with some of these initiatives and ideas that these very bright, smart people are coming to us to discuss about. Excellent. So we look forward to hearing more about this, uh, this new company and I'm sure we'll have other occasions to, to do so. I'd like to thank you, uh, the four of us, and uh, we will now uh, actually turn to the panel discussion. We will, uh, we will discuss the role of industrial R&D in innovation ecosystems and to let uh, the five speakers, the five next speakers, time uh, to, to join us. Uh, we'll just show you a very short video that is actually a presentation of Exploration, Bernard's uh, company. And then when, when we'll be back, we'll, uh, we'll welcome our five next speakers. So bear with us. We'll see you in just a minute. Thank you.